Hi everyone, welcome to today's session. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Jess from the This Is Beyond team. It's great to have you with us. Today's panel is about, is a regional focus on Asia, which we're excited to bring to you. We've got a selection of some well-known industry names who I'm sure you'll recognize joining the discussion and they're all based in different parts of Asia. So it's sure to be an insightful and thought-provoking discussion. Please do use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screens because there'll be plenty of time for questions from the audience to our panelists later on. And I'd like to introduce Kissa Castaneda, who is our moderator today. She has a dual role. She's the editor-in-chief of Tatla Asia in Singapore and also the regional editor for travel and design of Tatla Asia. So I'm going to hand over to Kissa now and she'll introduce our, panels, our pan panelists. Over to you, Kissa. Thanks, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, good evening. I don't know, everyone's welcome from all over the world. Again, my name is Kisa Castaneda. I'm with the Tatler Asia Group. It's really an honor to moderate this panel today. And joining me today are three really amazing people in the travel industry all across from Asia. We have Catherine Davis, we have Andreas Gosenki, and Jinu Park. So I'll let them introduce themselves um, and I'll start with Catherine. Oh, good afternoon from Hong Kong. Um, I'm lucky to be based in this uh, wonderful city. Um, firstly, I wanted to say a big thank you to the Rosewood Hotel who have kindly let me use one of their gorgeous rooms today. Um, working from home uh, with children around uh, always comes with challenges and interruptions. So I thought it would be safer uh, to be elsewhere today. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to uh, Stephanie and the team at This Is Beyond for inviting me today. Um, um, it is a privilege to be on the panel uh, today with Kissa, Andreas and Janu. Um, so I work for 360 Private Travel, uh, which uh, for anyone that does not know, um, is a private luxury travel club uh, where our focus is on providing an extremely high level of service to our clients for their travel needs globally. Um, 360 has been in operation for 11 years now. Um, our head office in the, is in the UK. Um, we now have partners in Europe, US and of course Asia. Um, I look after the Asia team where we have a team in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, our Asia team mainly has clients uh, based in Hong Kong and Singapore of course, but we do have clients um, elsewhere um, as far as New Zealand and Australia too. Great, thanks Catherine. Over to Andreas. Yeah, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm based in Bali and uh, greet you all from here, from the island. Uh, originally uh, a German and um, discovered my early love for travel um, uh, and foreign places um, with uh, hotel internships and then basically moved very soon on to Asia to take uh, uh, stints in Myanmar. Uh, Oman and uh, Malaysia before I settled here in Bali seven years ago uh, to join Destination Asia. Um, um, it's probably well known to you all. We're operating in 11 countries, particularly in Asia, on, on a higher end level uh, of um, DMC management and um, uh, client. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, of course, as uh, Catherine already so kindly said, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be invited to um, share thoughts here and uh, discuss a bit with um, Catherine uh, Gino under your uh, kind uh, guidance, Kissa. And um, yeah, um, I'm going to be excited uh, for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes um, what uh, we may can all share and um, uh, bring to the table. Great. Thanks so much, Andreas. We're all jealous that you're in Bali. I'm sure everyone is dreaming of going there as well. Lastly, <laughs> Lastly, Janu. Hello, I'm uh, Janu Park. Um, originally, my office is in Singapore, but I'm actually riding out the COVID lockdown in Seoul, Korea. So hello from Seoul. Um, uh, so I, I lead uh, Asia Pacific uh, business for Design Hotels. Design Hotels is a um, curated collection of independently minded hotels uh, around the world. We have about 300 over hotels and 60 destinations and uh, excited to be here and excited to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So as we mentioned, everyone's from all over. I'm based in Singapore and we, Asia is a huge region, as we all know. And what I, th I guess the first question is, can you tell us what the situation is on the ground 
and what do you see changing in the coming weeks? So I will start with Janu. Wow, coming weeks, okay. <laughs> um, well, we've certainly been carefully monitoring development in Asia Pacific, uh, China and uh, other parts of Asia for what I call leading indicators of recovery. And uh, obviously from that, trying to understand uh, consumer behavior patterns. As you all know, you know, from the endless news cycle, China entered this crisis first and it, it has come out of it first. Uh, what we are observing though is not a, is, a, is actually a gradual, not a V-shaped recovery. Um, so nationwide occup hotel occupancy in China has reached 50% a couple of weeks ago. Um, in fact, it took 21 weeks, uh, almost five, five months to get to that point from the lows of single digits at the end of January. And um, I, I do want to start by saying that it's, it's important to note that, that that type of even a moderate recovery was only possible due to a highly coordinated, um, really a central government driven uh, with strong participation from provincial authorities to really get the engine cranking again. And I think it's reasonable to say that that type of centrally planned, coordinated recovery effort really cannot be replicated elsewhere. Uh, so I think you know, it's important that we think about that as we, as we chart our recovery and, and, and you know, have a look at uh, what's happening in places like China. In terms of the recovery pattern itself, um, it, it really started out with leisure, uh, leisure versus corporate, I mean, and um, starting with the mid-scale and economy segment. Um, as you all know, the midweek corporate business simply just does not exist right now, um, and which negatively impacts upscale and uh, luxury business. But we are seeing some catch up in the luxury market and uh, that's, that's positive. Great, thanks. Um, you wanna add more? You're gonna add some more? Yeah, a little bit. So, so that's, uh, you know, that's what's happening in China. Um, outside of China and Asia Pacific countries also, um, all these countries are really starting to bring um, some sense of normalcy back. Um, similar to the situation in China, other large domestic economies like Japan, Korea, Australia, Thailand, there is some local leisure travel. Um, you know, what, what has caught us off guard somewhat is that um, uh, the border opening decisions have been much slower than, uh, than what we originally anticipated. Uh, in fact, to date, there's no confirmed border opening announcement or even a definitive schedule for opening from any country. Uh, we are in the US and, and in Europe, you, pro you probably know we're witnessing this pent up demand to travel for the summer season. And in time for that, you know, there's systematic opening of uh, borders and economy. But you know, I think realistically, this will be a little bit difficult in Asia Pacific. Um, a unique trend in APAC, though, is uh, these what we call green lanes and travel bubbles to allow essential business travel uh, to, to really protect industries and trade, uh, the trade. Um, and, and that requires documentation processes, sometimes full 14 day quarantine or, or even some short quarantine combined with testing. Uh, so, so it is um, a little bit limited in volume. Um, it's not that I, I'm trying to start off this discussion with doom and gloom, but I, you know, first of all, I think it's important to provide the lay of the land uh, through the latest developments that we're tracking. But it's also those latest developments that allow us to evaluate what is to come. Uh, we, we are getting some credible reports from Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and Maldives and the like, um, you know, just about to make some announcements about uh, systematic border open. So we're, we're really waiting, uh, eagerly waiting for that kind of news. Kiss about I think you. we're all waiting for it, Janu. I mean, being in Singapore, the border is still close to Malaysia and also to Indonesia, which is literally only 40 minutes by boat to a nice island over there. So let me ask you, Andreas, what is the situation in Bali and Indonesia as a whole, considering it's an archipelago? Yeah, it's, it's probably a little bit different, but then... Um, as we all know, similar over the ASEAN and, and APEC situation. Um, uh, Gino said it so well, uh, which is a point for me as well. So far, basically, in none of our destinations, borders are open, right? So what we can kind of see uh, starting is, is a bit of domestic travel 
uh, uh, in, in the countries. Um, in Indonesia in particular, as you said correctly, uh, being an archipelago, uh, it's been um, fairly easy for the different regions to, to kind of manage their own area. Bali, for example, has been kind of closed off to all the other areas and regions in Indonesia for quite a fair long time. Uh, and while, for example, the central government is uh, very interested to um, see um, what protocols and what, what, what levels can be um, as fast as possible be in place uh, for a destination like Bali, but also Jakarta and you mentioned before the uh, island connectivity to, to Singapore, Batam is on their list um, uh, to see, uh, to open this up as soon as possible for foreign tourists, not the whole country, but selected areas. But then you have the local government side, uh, who has, of course, their uh, um, internal or local interests uh, to respect and to review as well, who are uh, currently uh, probably more the ones who are holding back a little bit. Um, and um, then um, you have other countries like uh, Vietnam, for example, uh, where, where the situation seems to be... Um, more back to normal for inside the country. But then Vietnam, I think, has uh, uh, gained quite uh, praise for, for the handling of the situation. And uh, possibly their interests in the country are uh, not as focused on tourism as it would be in Indonesia. Um, so it's going to be a question for them on um, how long they're holding on to keep the borders closed so that they don't have um, a situation or have, have, have more attraction to, to other investments or things like that. So uh, the situations, I think, are uh, as, an, as an APEC uh, uh, very similar, uh, but um, everybody has, of course, his local interests um, that that going to be uh, reviewed or um, is, uh, is a big consideration. Uh, of how soon we would be seeing tourists to return. Yeah, back to you. Thanks, Andreas. And Indonesia is a huge country with 13,000 islands. So I guess reopening and managing it is very difficult. Let's move over to Catherine, uh, where Hong Kong, beautiful place, lots of little islands as well. Tell us about the situation there when it comes to travel and also maybe a little bit about the political situation. Okay, so um, I guess backtracking a little bit. Um, so 2020 um, started off um, for 360, um, like um, every year, it's a busy time for booking luxury travel. Um, and then the week before Chinese New Year, um, so we're talking about mid um, January, is when COVID-19 really started to have an impact. And then uh, during Chinese New Year, it started to ramp up um, even more. And we had lots of clients traveling, um, you know, a few phone calls, a few were worried. Um, and then during Chinese New Year is when we received the news um, from the government that the schools would not open after Chinese New Year. So obviously the children had only been back to school for two weeks, um, Chinese New Year, and then we found out that the schools weren't opening. So that was when it really all started to have a big impact in Hong Kong. Um, after Chinese New Year is normally the second peak busy booking period of the year for us. And of course, this just didn't happen. Um, it was when we began changing and postponing existing bookings and obviously cancelling some too. Um, that was for trips for imminent departure and for travel up and including Easter. Um, and then the borders uh, closing in March and the government putting into place the 14 day quarantine for anyone returning. Um, the booking postponements and cancellations continued. So um, fast forwarding, you know, to now five months later. Um, the situation now is very much um, that of feeling in a bubble, really. Uh, the Hong Kong government has dealt with the situation rapidly and quite drastically. But as of today, there has been uh, 1,234 cases and only seven deaths, which is quite remarkable, really. Um, our biggest restriction with regards to our clients traveling um, is that since um, March, you know, it was actually the 25th of March, um, they imposed the 14 day quarantine on anyone entering. Um, you know, it, it, it just really um, just affects anyone's thoughts on travel. Um, so the situation basically, just to give an example on how strict it is, um, anyone arriving at the airport is coached over to the expo center and has to do the COVID test, which can take up to eight hours. 
and then on producing a negative test result uh, you are issued with a tracking bracelet uh, which means you cannot leave uh, your home after any, you know under any circumstances for 14 days um, uh, and then obviously there's always the possibility of uh, flying into Hong Kong and uh, you know, testing positive. And if that happens, it means going into a government hospital um, until you then pass um, a test, a COVID test negatively three times. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a huge restriction um, there. Um, but um, there is a huge uh, pent up demand for many of our clients. Um, you know, um, we've been in this situation for a very long time, a lot longer than uh, uh, the rest of the world. Um, so, but even as borders open up for travel, clients are not going to want to travel while there is such strict quarantines in place. So with regards to the coming weeks, we are very much reliant on uh, the current government rules being relaxed uh, before we start to be in a position to look, book overseas travel for any departures in the next few months. Um, so for now, we're concentrating on uh, staycations. Uh, and then overseas trips for potentially Q4, um, but more realistically for 2021, um, but with um, flexible terms, which I know we're going to talk about later, Kissa. Um, um, but, you know, despite, um, you know, the tough time, obviously I've been a bit negative there. But, um, one huge positive that's come from all of this in this, you know, awful situation with regards to travel is that we've been you know, thanked numerous times by our clients and it's become so clear to many of them uh, the benefits of booking with an agent um, for the support that we're able to give them. So, you know, that to us, that's a huge positive. Definitely the intel can't be, you can't put a price tag on that, right? The intel, the experience. Um, somebody asked a question about the Hong Kong quarantine. Is it for residents as well? Before I move on to the next question. Yes. It is. So for residents, returning residents. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So Thanks. very strict. <laughs> very strict. Yeah. Here as well. Um, you mentioned staycation, so I'm gonna transition now into hotels, uh, which obviously this is not the first time the travel industry has faced such a challenge. How different is this crisis? Do you think, Janu, when it comes to you know the hotel industry, how are they? how are they facing this challenge? You know, cleanliness, protocols, safety, all of this, uh, I'm sure your member hotels are tackling that at the moment. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a time for a real meaningful reset. And, and I know that the words are cheap and those are words that I used a lot, but uh, you know, as, as, as I prepare for your question, you know, I, I thought about some of the more bigger issues where that's really making this downturn or recession so different from any other. Um, and, and I could, you know, I wanted to quickly talk about four things. The first is uh, this issue of cautious consumer sentiment, which, which I'll explain a little bit. Um, and then specifically on health and safety, this complexity of local mandates versus um, brand standards, if you will, of a design hotel or any hotel company. So that complexity. And then third, um, uh, we're starting to use some technology, so I'll, I'll talk about some of that, some of those examples and uh, smart usage of technology and other areas of innovation. And lastly, um, you know, as we look to the future, uncertainty around longer term feasibility of some of the things that we are doing right now. I mean, I, I think we are really reacting to this new, new reality, and I think we have to think about how feasible this is uh, really in the longer term. So. So starting with the cautious consumer sentiment, it, 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 goes out without, it goes without saying health and safety is top of mind for everybody. Um, it is one thing to reopen hotels, allow dine-ins and restaurants and increase uh, flight capacity, but it's uh, really another for people to really go out and you know, uh, live normal lives. As countries implement phased openings, uh, what we are definitely seeing is in the beginning stages, a, a burst of that pent up demand. And again, just going back to the China example, during the May Day week, there's a, you know, people really just went out and spent. Uh, and that's great to see. But uh, the, the second holiday period, which happened to be actually last week with the Dragon Boat Festival, we, we definitely saw, um, you know, that, that bullishness tapering off a little bit. Um, 
so it's so one of the most important focus of our hotels right now is really giving travelers that sense of confidence that uh, there is a reasonable trade-off between health and safety and uh, this inevitably burdensome hassle that you have to go through when you travel. So in terms of that, you know, hassle, if you will, uh, every jurisdiction has its own guideline. Um, so, you know, as, as a hotel brand, we share deep cleaning guidelines or FMB operation guidelines. But the reality is every country, city, every state and city has its own mandate. So what we are prioritizing is really to help hotels clearly communicate what those local codes are, uh, certainly on the hotel websites, but also in things like confirmation emails and, and the like. Um, now, having said this, some of our hotels, you know, in our portfolio, for example, our retreats in Japan or retreats in rural China, they're well designed for this anyway. So for example, you know, ryokan type service, breakfast or dinner in a private dining room or a Japanese counter seat seating, you know, that inherently provides health, health and safety. Um, and also what we're hearing from the customers is this, uh, you know, this notion of fully sufficient travel experience within the property. Um, so, you know, naturally we, we have hotels that are wanting to take even more ownership of uh, the provenance of where their food supply comes from, for example, and be able to really, you know, communicate the safety uh, uh, of the provenance of that food and let the customers really have a fully sufficient uh, stay experience within the hotel without having to leave the hotel. So as we're, you know, helping hotels prepare for a relaunch, in fact, we have a campaign uh, being launched as we speak uh, in July uh, particularly in places, you know, resorts like in Thailand or retreats in Japan, uh, where we're making a half board package a standard. Um, I mean, Kissy, you know, we're, we're, we're familiar with uh, this QR code based constant yeah. check ins and check out. That's, uh, I mean, obviously that type of technology can only be provided at the government level, but I think, you know, that type of automation together with, uh, you know, smart, Rel relatively hassle-free, you know, operational standards in at the hotels. Uh, that smart balance, I think, is absolutely key. And that really gives people confidence to go out and live their lives. Yeah, the um, conference check-in, all of those, a lot of hotels are doing that innovation. If you guys are not familiar, here in, in Singapore, we do have a system called Safe Entry, which is what Chinu mentioned is a QR code. I'm sure other countries in Asia have already implemented similar tracing apps and um, QR code entry systems as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe slightly, you know, on a related topic of innovation, this is also making us think a lot about what, what is a really hotel about? And, um, you know, at Design Hotels, we've, we've always thought that hotel is not just a place for sleeping and eating. Uh, in fact, many of our hotels, even before COVID, was really a platform for connecting the community and in some cases explicitly giving back to the community. Um, so, you know, using an example again, our trunk hotels in Tokyo just reopened yesterday. Um, and during the closure, you know, the, just about the only business they had was uh, their e-commerce site selling, uh, the, you know, retailing their products. So, you know, they have quite a bit of apparel or lifestyle products uh, for retail. Um, I, I, you know, I, I see a lot of our hotels, you know, really diversifying the notion of what, what hotel is. And uh, uh, I think that's another innovation that's going to come out of this time. Perhaps I end, end with a view to the future. So clearly we are reacting to this new, new normal. Um, middle seats are vacant in flights. You know, rooms are kept vacant for 24 hours between check-ins and check-outs. These are possible now because we just don't have a lot of demand. Um, but um, these are short-term reactions and you know, we, we will have to evolve into a very different future reality and travel. Uh, but you know, innovations come out of crisis and um, you know, we, we certainly hope and believe that's the direction we're going. Uh, whether it's the phys physical aspects of how to design a public space in a hotel, you know, considering all these self, uh, health and safety issues, or even the non-physical aspects of how do we create more meaningful customer interactions in a contactless world, 
Um, you know, these are just big, big questions we, we have to ask and uh, take on. So we expect there to be uh, big and meaningful changes. That's what we're hoping for, more connections with less contact, I suppose. Um, I'm going to move on to Andreas now, uh, where as a DMC, obviously hotels are only one part of the whole ecosystem and equation. And Jinu mentioned that, you know, hotels want to be the destination. And if you're on a staycation, that's possible. You don't want to leave your hotel. But as a DMC, you have other elements in place and in play as well. How is this crisis different for you? What are the changes that you notice from pre-COVID to now? And any policy or procedures specific to Indonesia that you'd like to share as well? No, I mean, um, I'm starting maybe a bit at the, at the last part that, that you just asked in regards to changing of policies or procedures. Um, these are not generally only Indonesia uh, part and so on. And as uh, Gino said, and, and the hotels have to work them, we as a DMC, uh, we basically uh, uh, have to look in all layers of the of the travel services. Um, while we while we need to be assured that hotels are um, particular, also when we look into boutique hotels in our destinations, which are maybe more local, where we maybe even need to assist and and and, and help a little bit on some protocol guidance. Uh, but we are to some extent uh, responsible of of what we're selling, right? But it goes then very much, as you said, into the outside and the activities, and that's probably a little bit more of uh, uh, an area where we have to work very closely with um, with our local partners and um, develop them and that that's happening at the moment for us uh, group wide and then of course looking into each individual uh, local destination of of what is necessary so we have we have drawn our our uh, enhancements to our standard SOPs that we have already uh, and developing that right now on a group wide uh, level in regards to uh, possible manuals or just individual uh, pinpoints uh, particularly here in Indonesia we're working actually with a couple of other friendly uh, uh, DMCs together on on sustainable and health and safety since a few years already uh, this is now a, a great platform for us to just basically put that one layer on top and going out to our activity suppliers in, in, in Indonesia as being an archipelago, as you said before correctly, is uh, we have so many boat services, right? So this is a different layer that we need to look into. Yes, uh, an airline has probably their standards and other things, but how is the local ferry from, from, from Java over to Bali or how are the fast boats from Bali to Gili Islands? Uh, that that will be similar in, 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 in other destinations. So um, that that's a process that is working on now for, for I would say, probably two months uh, already and, 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 and still in process. And we are, of course, now getting to the point of how soon um, we hopefully can have some, some, some customers. It's very actually interesting. We had guests arriving um, uh, into the destination with visa and all the formalities um, which probably had stay permits uh, you don't know them exactly but but some services booked so it's interesting to see that sometimes um, but uh, challenges uh, and uh, what has changed uh, possibly um, I think uh, a lot of um, filtering of informations and, and, and what is viable we, you you want to as you said correctly uh, government protocols, government uh, uh, um, policies. Um, so very often you have your idea and you have your elements and understanding of what is necessary to be put in place. But you have to, of course, also somehow wait for that official kind of documents uh, so that you cover both sides. Uh, and that sometimes takes in some destinations uh, a little bit longer. Um, but they're coming through now so we can compare them and, and update them uh, and, and have these kind of things. Um, social network is of course always very fast as well as the media with some kind of emails of this will open up and that will open up and then you have to bring it down again and say like well, uh, it will probably take a bit longer until until we're ready or uh, the, the destination um, will open up uh, so that's that's probably uh, most um, changes for us uh, government policies will help um, but there's a lot of um, working and thinking uh, within the, uh, the industry, of course, um, forward. Um, I'm actually uh, quite, um, yeah, how you say that, proud or quite, uh, quite um, I know that, that yeah, that uh, basically in all, in all the Asian destinations in APEC, um, um, the, the destinations will be ready to, to welcome the tourists. But um, 
there is there is going to be maybe probably one other aspect uh, which we are also working on uh, we will have to review certain products and we might gonna have to take them off the list and say um they wouldn't work right now under the current situation and understanding of social distancing or other health and hygiene um, elements and and that's uh, that's uh, another element that we as a dmc have to um, um, observe or uh, watch out for thank you andreas um there's actually a question here and it's both for you and catherine before i move on to catherine about what the clients want and what the tourists are actually looking for the travelers rather um Sergio, Ask or Sergio, and hopefully saying your name correctly, asking, is there an opportunity for a more active way of seeing destinations? Encouraging travels for a more green or eco approach, um, walking or biking as a, being outdoors in nature than being confined between walls or inside a car. So th this virus has obviously made us a little bit more hesitant of spending time indoors with other people. So any thoughts on that? Maybe I'll start with Catherine. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we're just at the, um, the start really of, um, you know, looking at, uh, the bigger picture and travel, um, uh, you know, overseas, um, getting on airplanes and everything at the moment, um, we're more concentrating on staycations, but, uh, um, yeah, I think, um, there's been, um, you know, positives that have come out of, um, you know, the, the terrible situation. So, um, people are going to be looking for uh, more unique opportunities, um, being outdoors, um, discovering uh, new opportunities, being with nature. I think definitely um, that is something that we uh, need to embrace for sure. You have clients asking, I mean, I'm sure a lot of clients are asking where they can go and what's possible and you use your intel for that. Are they actively looking or the is there demand there for remote travel? Yes, I mean, again, um, it's funny, we, we have been having inquiries um, and then, you know, people are still quite hesitant to, you know, push it over the line, um, you know, especially obviously given the situation in Hong Kong, um, you know, with the uh, quarantine on return. Um, that's our biggest stumbling block at the moment. Um, but yeah, for Q4, I mean, we're, we're hopeful that that, um, you know, will come down. If it doesn't, then obviously we're pushing into 2021. And yeah, I think uh, for definite, people are gonna be looking at different ways of traveling now, um, you know, really experiencing um, nature and, uh, you know, being outdoors, maybe not, uh, traveling as often um, you know in Hong Kong we have many public holidays um, and people do travel often during the year um, so I think that will probably be cut back and people will go on a, a bigger longer more meaningful trip rather than lots of little trips um, so yeah they, this is where we can work with our DMCs to really give them um, an amazing experience uh, but at the same time, keeping it safe. Andreas, did you want to add um, to that response or it's fine? No, I mean, uh, Catherine, Catherine has the sources and, and, and is absolutely correct. That's what we see as well. Um, in regards to the question is absolutely perfect and in, in, in looking into that. And that comes in the same kind where I said we, we have to take out products. We looked at the same time, which products do we actually want to push which products want we have our sales teams to understand that these are the ideal products. And we have, of course, uh, now in Indonesia again, uh, areas or islands where we can be uh, rather secluded as a customer, um, uh, you know, to travel and, and, and stay in a, in a resort with only a few rooms um, that we can very well um, control and understand their, their, their protocols. But the, the outdoors is, of course, uh, in our area, uh, in most of the uh, Asian countries, I would say um, a great possibility um, because of the temperatures and uh, in the high seasons, right? So um, walking tours, bicycle tours, um, um, they are all uh, in our standard programs in, in all destinations. And um, we're definitely um, uh, pushing our teams to include more of these uh, in, the, uh, in the itineraries that is, that is uh, yeah good point yeah i think also more people are 
um, thinking about wellness and being active, being on lockdown, like just going for a run, that, that kind of behavioral change is there. I know we don't have enough, a, a lot of time, so I, and there are a couple of questions. So while Janu is still here, um, I'd like to ask, you mentioned innovation, and actually all three of you mentioned behavioral changes, shifts, and innovation. Uh, question for everyone, is it reasonable to expect similar measures such as QR codes or technology in the rest of the world? Or is Asia better set up to roll out these than elsewhere? Who wants to go first? Jinu, I suppose. <laughs> I, th I think, I think um, you know, QR adoption of QR codes certainly a lot more pervasive in certain Asian countries, no doubt about that. So I don't think it's one technology fits all, you know, so, uh, but it is about that trade off between um, confidence in health and safety and, you know, the hassle, you know, this kind of burdensome hassle, right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, you want to feel safe, but if they ask you to fill out 20 different forms to get in somewhere, you know, it's just not going to work, you know? Uh, so I think um, that's where whatever the tools you, we have in the different uh, places, and, and like I said, you know, it's not like we have a choice because, you know, the states and the countries and cities will mandate certain procedures. So, so it is, you know, while following those uh, procedures and at the same time, you know, operators having applying, you know, really customer centric common sense to, 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 to ease that hassle, you know. So, I mean, we, we certainly see where the where, where COVID cases have stabilized and the economy is open, but because it's burdensome, because it's just complicated to get out, uh, you know, that suppresses demand. So, so obviously we're, we're kind of learning through that, but uh, you know, it's, it's all obviously as an operator, hospitality provider or service provider, we just need to think about that. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to add and when it comes to Techno the use of technology or innovation in the whole travel experience? Yeah, I can maybe just add that I think um, that whole online provision of information uh, will become, will get uh, another big boost um, because you will shed away, uh, start in restaurants, right? Restaurants uh, are already here on the island and other areas, they're already providing you barcodes to, to see their menu. Um, because there is the sensitivity of having a menu handed over. Um, um, we're working at the moment on, on, on um, online provision of uh, all the travel documents, particularly then also, again, the um, provision of, of uh, sanitized travel provision um, information and so on that we have to provide. But probably we will not necessarily have too much to hand over um, to a customer anymore um, in, in, in physical kind of... Um, uh, material also, I think uh, these these elements um, that has not to do with the the, the QR barcode on securities check-ins and things like that, but um, we will definitely see that uh, coming. Which, for my side, is um, or for our side, looking anyway into sustainability the whole time and, and, and driving right now very much to get our travel license certification. Even in that time, uh, that's a that's a fantastic um, push more. Uh, to get away from from some paper printing or other elements and uh, and these kind of parts, right? So uh, there's also the positive aspects, possibly. That's true. I mean, trying to make everything seamless and easy. Catherine, I wanted to ask you because we didn't get to really jump, like go deep into the question I wanted to ask. Uh, is are tra do travelers have this sort of resistance? Uh, what are their anxieties, and how do you soothe them, or how do you address those questions when they come about? Um, well, I mean, I know I briefly mentioned um, at the very beginning of this meeting, um, I mean, without a doubt, uh, the key is flexibility. Um, so being able to work, or well, we've been able to work um, and obviously putting more work in with working with our suppliers, our DMCs and our hotel partners to um, help us give flexibility to the clients. Um, 
For example, um, most recently we've been working with a supplier um, that offered us um, like a pay now, stay later offer, which means clients have the flexibility to pay a great rate now, um, but give their dates later on. Um, and then they can then amend their dates. Um, I mean, this one was actually uh, amending up until the end of uh, 2021, um, if there are restrictions in place. Um, so, you know, that's, that's definitely the key um, for us in Hong Kong with, you know, not being able to travel imminently, but people really wanting to book something to look forward to. So with that type of flexibility, we've been taking bookings. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that I would highlight, first of all. Um, and then, Kiss, I know you mentioned... Um, remote travel um, and that's something that is um, a noticeable change. Uh, clients are looking for more remote destinations um, but preferably without complicated um, travel to get there. Um, the, the accommodation that clients are now looking at um, is going uh, more down the lines of private villas and smaller boutique style hotels rather than your larger hotels um, for obvious reasons. Um, I guess, I mean, again, I'm referring to Hong Kong because that's what I know best. I mean, again, we're very much in that safe bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. So the process is why put yourselves at unnecessary risk? Um, so they want to travel, but they're going to really look at how they travel. Um, even when air bridges um, come into effect, uh, there will be concern for many about traveling on airplanes and through airports. Um, so this is where we can see the rise in private air and, uh, you know, this is definitely something that's being asked for. Um, before the borders closed, and obviously, you know, COVID was very much a thing, but before the borders closed, um, we were getting inquiries for private boat charters in the same way uh, as the private air. Um, and we can clearly see that this is something that's going to be um, a demand, private uh, boats and yachts. Uh, you know, going forward. Um, so, yeah, I mean, f for us at the, this moment in time, um, you know, until the borders relax, uh, we are concentrating on staycations. Um, of course, the majority of our clients are based in Hong Kong and uh, we have some stunning hotels here. And we've been working uh, closely with our partnered hotels to sell vacation packages. Um, and this has been great for the hotels in Hong Kong. Um, as everybody knows, um, Hong Kong has suffered um, terribly in the last year with the protests and riots. Um, yeah, it's been over a year actually. And some of our partnered hotels have seen room nights fall to single digits. Um, and just in the last few weeks, uh, they've gone up. You know, we've, uh, a couple of our partners have seen them in the uh, 30 to 40 percent. So. Um, you know, it's great to see and give back to the local hotels. Um, we have clients obviously based in Singapore as well and Australia and New Zealand. Unfortunately, um, as you know, Kisa, you know, Singapore is not open yet for staycations. Um, but for Australia and New Zealand, we've been working with DMCs locally there, um, partnering with hotels there to be able to put together staycations for clients that are based there. Um, and I guess, um, we just feel overall luxury travel is going, going to become more selected um, for definitely, you know, for the next or for the foreseeable, really. Um, and I mentioned just briefly earlier, um, clients are not going to, I feel, we feel as a team that clients are not going to travel as often. Uh, but when they do, that trip's got to be more meaningful. Um, maybe they're ticking off bucket lists. Um, they're mo more focused on nature and giving back, sustainable travel. Um, you know, one thing, a positive thing that we've all seen through this crisis is, um, you know, the positive effect it's had on our planet, um, you know, from the world not traveling. Um, we were talking just briefly before we went online about uh, the pollution levels dropping in both uh, Indonesia and uh, Hong Kong. And it's actually quite incredible. So, yeah, um, another thing um, is... Sorry, Catherine, I'm going to stop you there for a second because I know Jinu has to leave, like, imminently. He's off to the, to the port. Um, Jinu, did you want to add some last points? Actually, somebody asked a question which I thought would be a nice ending for you as well because you mentioned innovation quite a number of times. 
Do you see new, any new business models emerging from this crisis? Are you there still? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's, like, that's like a 30-minute conversation. I know, um, it is. It is. And I'm like, <laughs> asking you to answer in a minute <laughs> yeah well well first of all let me start by you know excuse me for being disruptive but i unfortunately had this uh, commitment as i have to have a hard stop but um you know i, I guess i'll maybe just talk about and ex expand a little more about what i talked about before you know hotel uh and i think many of you will agree is is no longer just a place for lodging and dining um, you know, hotel is um, um, a, a, um, a vehicle, a venue, or a place to to, to achieve something. You know, so you know if that's uh, for a traveler, if it's meaningful travel, finding yourself and achieving something, it is that. If it's for a hotel owner that uses it as a vehicle to give back to the society, it is that. Um, and I think. Um, you know, and, and we have these tendencies every time there's a bit of a crisis, we, we reflect and look back and pause and look back. And, and I think this particular crisis is uh, helping us do that in a in genuinely a profound way, obviously, because this is a very different kind of crisis. And, um, and I think it's not just a hope. I think our, you know, if I think about our hotel owners community, uh, they're independently minded people anyway. You know, they're, they're kind of visionaries in their own space anyway. But I think it's really pushing them to think more about what is the role, what is a hotel about, you know? And I think, um, I think it's just difficult to say it's specifically this or that, but I do think there'll be genuine uh, innovations that come out of that thinking of how do I use this place or a destination as a vehicle for something? So you see a lot of changes coming soon in your hotels for sure. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Room rates up. Yeah. <laughs> Room rates up. Okay, you know, um, uh, I know with, with that again, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, I will graciously and quietly duck out. Okay. You can reach him on Purposeful Traveler. That's his Instagram handle. Um, he, so Janu was speaking about, uh, thank you, Janu. We'll see you very soon. Juno is speaking about, um, you know, the changes, innovation, and um, how travel, how, how we can use this giant pause for, for making sure that travel is a force for good. I interrupted you there, Catherine, and you were just getting into the groove of, like, explaining about sustainable travel, purposeful travel, and how your clients actually want that. So for both you and Andreas, any thoughts on you know, how travel is going to evolve or has evolved already. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> um, I mean, one uh, point that I was going to uh, mention um, is obviously wellness uh, in luxury travel has been on the rise for a few years now. And I can definitely see this becoming even more of a focus. Um, you know, for again, for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's something, another area that we will be looking to focus on um, at working with our DMCs and our hotels. You know, clients are going to be, um, you know, more focused on that for sure. Um, I, Andreas, I'm not sure whether you wanted to uh, add any more. No, I mean, I can just, sorry. About yeah. wellness the changing nature of travel yeah in in general but uh, i think i can hook easily in what, what catherine said that um, before already that it will be more selected and now focused and i think uh, um, we see that already and we do understand that um, also as as the inbound um, yeah um, management partner uh, the details of of an itinerary the details of of uh, what you're going to see and how you're going to see it are going to be more important. And I think um, Catherine is probably absolutely right when she says uh, there will be maybe a bit less traveled, but it will be then very important or very, very, um, yeah, uh, including everything. And I think th this will also lead to the individual um, guest uh, and customer to spend more time to to research, to investigate, to find out uh, what, 
what am I going to see there, uh, how it is provided? And that, that brings then these change and, and, and of course the must to us to really um, have this information ready, um, to be really eloquent on, on being able to explain situations and, and how um, the, um, the, the travel um, will, um, will work. And while you asked before, I think that you know how, how maybe the situation right now or the, 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 the um, um, pause uh, will, will, will give a chance. We definitely, as well as we work on the outside, right, on, on the external kind of provision and, and, and things, we have definitely turned internally. And uh, we're using that for um, a lot of training um, with the teams uh, uh, on, on, on focused uh, elements, but also on, 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 on a product. Uh, uh, other things, um, the, the, these in, uh, hygiene enhancements that everybody has to implement, they have to be understood, they have to be trained through, right? And not only to your colleagues in the office, for us as a DMC, this goes straight out to the guides, the drivers, uh, all kind of layers down. And um, I think this is, uh, um, the, the, that's where, where we focus uh, quite uh, to some extent at the moment on. Thank you, Andreas. Somebody also asked a question earlier that I wasn't able to, to share with you guys about um, how luxury travel is changing and how also brand names, will it be more important when it comes to a customer's consideration of safety? Because you mentioned, Andreas, that you are working on protocols that you're from a boutique villa, they would do it. But obviously, a lot of other brands, the big brands, the big boys, they have their own protocols in place. How do you think that will come into play? And for Catherine, how do you push that message to your clients? Or do your clients have a preference in luxury travel? Yeah, so maybe I start here quickly and then Catherine can uh, line this down to, to the customers directly message. Uh, there is a very valid point on it. And we thought about this already uh, right at the beginning. It's like, okay, these big brands, we don't really need to worry so much about it. They're going to have their corporate policies. And we, we know that there are um, um, the, the sources behind and the quality behind within their brand uh, to, uh, to, to get it right. So, so our internal focus was right away more towards the... Um, uh, local brands and, and, and support that level, particularly also because um, uh, we do have, of course, highly branded boutique hotels, but uh, as Catherine said before as well, that was clear as well, villas uh, and boutique uh, properties will become much more important uh, where you have uh, uh, as a customer a better overview of who you're sharing uh, facilities with. Uh, and um, I think there um, is the education probably needed. And, and, and that's where we're trying to work with assessments on them and also maybe give them a kind of a tick or something so we can um, ensure to, to uh, our external customer that uh, they are following similar protocols and things. But uh, the branded ones will have there, I think, a bit of an advantage currently. What about you, Catherine? Do you think um, if you're a self-contained accommodation or if it's private, but doesn't really have a brand name, does it affect the way you recommend it to your clients or do your clients ask for brand names? Um, I mean, our clients, um, it's very individual preferences. Um, some will um, ask for brand names and others want to go for um, the more private options. Um, obviously at the moment we're seeing um, requests more for the private options the smaller boutique hotels and this is where our relationship with our um, suppliers and our dmcs um you know really shows its full value um mm -hmm. and we the dmc partnerships that we have you know we completely trust we're com you know constantly uh, keeping in communication with them we have updates all the time um so we know that the products that the dmcs are, are offering are you know safe um, and obviously if a client, um, which does happen, especially, well, obviously again, I can only really speak for the Hong Kong client, but, uh, you know, when they are worried or nervous, um, about staying in a property, we can fully, um, you know, delve into uh, the property, uh, through the DMC to give them some answers just to put their mind at rest. Thank you. Okay. I think we're almost, um, time is almost out and Jessica is back. So thank you everyone very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Andreas and everyone who joined us today. Um, 
and I'm going to hand over to Jessica for her final words. Thank you so much, Kissa, and thanks uh, also to our panelists. I think it's clear that you know, there's obviously not a one size fits all approach to what we're going through and where the recovery will be. But I think today was really insightful and I really thank you all for your time. So to Catherine Andreas, Junu, who's obviously stepped off, um, but also Kissa as well for moderating. Thank you all so much uh, and for being so generous with your time today. Uh, the recording and takeouts of today's session will be shared with you all via email over the coming weeks. So keep an eye out for those in your inbox and also for future sessions, which we're running uh, most weeks. So keep an eye on your inbox. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.